is someone who probably really doesn't need a connection. So I think we agree. Uh, Bloom Tiller is Professor Emeritus of Stanford University, Department of Material Science and Engineering. And he had a distinguished, a very early career with uh, Industry, Westinghouse Research Laboratory, as well as then moving to Stanford University. Very distinguished career there in uh, standard orthodox uh, materials science and physics. And at Stanford is where he began very seriously investigating uh, psychoenergetic science as well in 1970. I wonder if that's the idea you got No, no, I came in with ten. Oh, okay. Thank God. <laughs> and that has really, as far as uh, we can see, turned into a lifetime of investigation and practice in psychoenergetic uh, science and psychospiritual growth. And I've had the honor and pleasure over the past couple of decades to have been interacting with Dr. Tiller in a few capacities, including relative to his important involvement together with Hiroshi Motoyama in the initial founding of this institute, CIHX. And yesterday, he was very kind to give us uh, a long time in the class I was teaching. Uh, uh, it was fun. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So, Dr. Wilton. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to see you all here and some faces that I recognize. I'm terrible with names, so forgive me. I remember sort of faces that, that I've been introduced to once or twice or three times. Anyway, the, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, what I plan to do with the talk is I will lecture for 15 to 20 minutes and then break for 10 minute Q&A and then come back and do another 15 to 20 minutes and break for 10 minutes of Q&A. So there'll be four breaks uh, Q&A and if the timing is right, everything will work out and I'll be on time. Um, I never quite know how long going through these PowerPoints uh, Sometimes I have an idea which I want to introduce, and I see I've made myself some notes here that, that uh, is not in the PowerPoint. And the second piece of housekeeping, they're not in the free white paper, which is going to be uh, free white paper number 26, which will be cover all the material plus a little more than is in this talk. And if everything goes well, then it'll be up on my website, tiller.org, by this afternoon. Um, it's, uh, I think it's 39 pages. So, text and, and uh, follow the slide, plus some more. Anyway, that's the, that's the housekeeping. Um, <laughs> um, I tend to think that nature is radiating to us all the time on many bands of physical reality and many dimensions in what we call reality. Um, and for the last 400 years, uh, dealing with orthodox science and orthodox medicine, we have covered one band one band, and very well. Um, <clears throat> and because there is such a plethora of information uh, flowing through our areas of consciousness, um, we need what I think is a ladder of understanding. Uh, because we have a long journey, what I call going to go home. Uh, which is the state of total coherence, which is still several epochs down the road. Uh, we are just completing 
of the physical epoch. And the other epochs that came before were pre-physical and they were invisible to our present eyesight. Um, and we're heading back in that direction. Um, and so all of these are different rungs of the ladder. The last 400 years we worked to prepare this bottommost rung. That's, that's where orthodox science is, and unfortunately, uh, much of it is, is very stuck. It tends to think that uh, nature is distance time only. But uh, that's perhaps appropriate for us as babes crawling across the floor of the universe, but it's uh, not in any way complete. So, trying to write theories of everything and so on without ever getting into the subtle domains which pretty much things appear to be going faster than light, um, it will take a bit of doing. We'll talk a good bit about that. So, basically there are two major beliefs that uh, Orthodox science wants to deal with. In terms of getting quantitative information, mathematically they think that all true science findings must be internally self-consistent with each other via a distance time only reference frame for studying nature. Uh, we've known for about 150 years that information in terms of human cognition and human capabilities uh, are not dependent upon distance and time. Some parts are. Certainly the meat of our bodies is dependent upon distance and time. But uh, our higher aspects uh, of self are outside distance and time. And that means that our quantum mechanics and the relativistic mechanics reference frames or paradigm that we use in the Orthodox community is not as much use to us as we might, might like to have. Um, and of course it's popular these days for if people don't understand something they say, oh, well, it's quantum mechanics answers that. That's not true. In any event, this is, this is the one piece. The second piece really is a carryover from the days of Descartes, in 1600 roughly. Descartes made a very useful assumption for that point of time, which was that no human qualities of consciousness, intention, emotion, mind, or spirit can significantly influence a well-designed target experiment in physical reality. And he did that in order to try to create a barrier between religion and science. I mean, the new science was growing, but they overturned the previous paradigms, which was a the theocratic one. And so religion was a very strong aspect of life in those days. And it took the order of a hundred years before um, that balance uh, developed. And the dilemma is that the Orthodox community unconsciously are holding that reference frame information, that statement by Descartes. It's, it's become a, well, it's, it's largely why Orthodox science um, is unhappy with things that might have been called uh, parapsychology. Um, and things that might be called psychoenergetic science, um, and things that would be future science. So, I have been surprised to see it in my wanderings through uh, science and the science community. And that being a uh, card carrying orthodox scientist, as well as someone who's stepped out of the box. Um, I understand, uh, understand what they're going through, but it would be very healthy for them if they were willing to step out of the box. 
uh, peer pressure and funding and all of those sorts of things are the price that often one pays when you uh, move too away, too far away from the herd in the Orthodox community. Anyway, that's human nature. Some major accomplishments that uh, we have in science, and I'm not giving a lot of them, but the, the key one, of course, is the development of the information about the four fundamental forces of nature, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, short-range nuclear force, and long-range nuclear force. I've called all the other hundreds and thousands of energies that we will meet on our journey home, uh, I call it subtle energies. And so when people ask me, what do I mean by subtle energies? I mean all those energies not included in the four fundamental forces that we accept today. Well, of course, a, a big signpost was the work of Planck and, and Bohr. Uh, their discussions and arguments. Uh, Einstein showed the mystic mechanics of the MC squared and, and the maximum velocity uh, from a distance time only reference frame uh, is that the velocity must always be lower than the velocity of light, like anything that has mass. We'll see that that isn't really true anymore. Um, de Broglie's concept was an important one, which I'll talk about, in terms of the particle pilot wave uh, duality. It turns out that if you simultaneously assume that there's particle behavior and wave behavior, then you can write, ultimately write all the equations of quantum mechanics. So that's a very important piece. Uh, and it's a good beginning, but quantum mechanics is not complete. Uh, I don't think relativistic mechanics is complete either. <coughs> Dirac's concept of where mass comes from um, in the evolvement, let's say, of the Big Bang, so you start seeing uh, matter of an electromagnetic nature. But he talked about it as coming out of a negative energy C, uh, which Orthodox science had trouble with it. They didn't understand what negative energy could be. Uh, and thus they sort of discarded it. They gave him the Nobel Prize for finding the antimatter, which uh, is positive matter, um, in the negative energy sea, as distinct from the uh, electric electric matter, which is our world today, largely. And then, of course, of late, we've seen these invisible gravitational attractors, which is now called dark matter, and dark energy. And then, uh, I will show that, that if you look more closely at Turak's concept, you can define where dark matter, dark energy comes from. And also, people were pleased and surprised that instead of at the outer envelope of the universe, uh, whether our stars and planets still expanding the, uh, beyond the cosmos, present cosmos, um, they expected it to be decelerating, but in fact they find it accelerating, and the present paradigm can't explain that, and we'll see that it naturally falls out of it. Uh, a broader look, that's called the subtle energy look. It's, it's one of the courses, areas of the course of subtle energy is dark matter. And so, um, I'm not trying to make a, a list that uh, I just want to put a bit there. Now, there appear to be a variety of subtle problems. I may have given you that idea, um, and I mean to buttress that idea. And those problems are with our orthodox science paradigm. And one of the key ones with respect to the uh, first idea was, as I said earlier, about 100, for 150 years we have 
serious experimental observation of anomalous human cognition and human forces that are not internally self-consistent with the orthodox belief uh, of distance time only. And uh, this is important because, as I said, the, the greater part of ourselves are outside of distance time. Uh, and if our orthodox science community had great integrity, or greater integrity than it actually has, they wouldn't have ignored this information. They wouldn't have swept it under the rug. They would have said, this is not internally self-consistent with our orthodox understanding. What must be different about nature than we know that causes this to happen? Because the experimental data is there. Instead, they swept it under the rug and did not want to address the existence of that experimental data. It's been around a long time, as I say, 150 years. Um, and the orthodox belief from the days of Descartes, and Descartes' assumption, um, in the last 15 years, and my colleagues and myself, um, we have proven unequivocally that um, human consciousness in the form of human intention can design very carefully conducted experiments and prove that intention can change the properties of materials, can change the condition of the space. Uh, and uh, so at least in today's world, uh, the assumption of Descartes is totally wrong. Humans have the capability, all humans ultimately have the capability of doing these things that we have been able to do in the laboratory. And so I'm going to talk about, just talk about them, because last year I laid out a lot of information about them. I will just introduce them. Basically, these are the four experiments, the beginning experiments. We've done a lot since, but uh, this is the, maybe I should go forward and say how we inserted the intention into the experiment. What we did is we imprinted a simple electrical device from a deep meditative state. And we, uh, we imprint with the, with the device, which call it, we call it an intention host device. It's very simple. It's the kind of um, electrical system you might have put together in the 1950s. It's not, it's not a modern day high power piece of electronics. And so, Four people sit around a tabletop, go into a deep meditative state, connect with each other, and connect with the unseen, and uh, activate the indwelling consciousness of the space, because consciousness is everywhere, and uh, then cleanse the space uh, mentally and emotionally, so that it becomes a sacred space that we use for imprinting the intention. And then we activate it sufficiently to lay, lift the gate symmetry state of the space beyond our normal uh, gate symmetry space, which is called the U1 state. Um, and it appeared experimentally that, that, that we were accessing what's called an issue 2 gate state, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so, this becomes the imprinted intention host device, and that's what we set perhaps within a foot or two of ex the particular experiment that we're going to uh, alter. Okay. So, uh, let's see, I have to go back one. So, these are the four experiments. We, the first intention was to increase the pH of water, the alkaline. Uh, acidic balance of water by one full pH unit uh, without any chemical additions. One pH unit is uh, 23.6 milli electron volts. Um, so you can get a quantitative number and we use that ultimately 
on foot with the game of the first sudden energy detector. I'll show you how that comes towards the end. And then for the same kind of water, the next one wants to uh, decrease the pH by one full pH unit. And this is a factor of 10 of hydrogen ion concentration in each case. So, and our measurement accuracy was 1 100 uh, of a pH unit. Both of those were remarkably successful. Uh, the third was to look at a biological system, an in vitro exposure of uh, an enzyme alkaline phosphatase to this conditioned space using this intention host device just for 30 minutes. And in 30 minutes, um, we were able to increase the chemical activity of ALP by about 30%. But P value is better than 0.001. And the fourth was an in vivo experiment with fruit fly larva. Um, and they were broadcast to for 28 days with a, uh, an intention host device. And the idea was to increase the ATP to ADP ratio, that is the uh, energy molecule versus its chemical precursor. So we go from uh, two phosphors in the chemical precursor to three phosphors in the uh, imprinted state. We were, and then we felt that if we did that and increased that, we would shorten the larval development time because it would be so physically fit um, significantly. And so what we found that we were able to uh, increase the ATP to ADP ratio by the order of 15 to 20 percent, but the p value is better than 0 0.001, and we're able to shorten the larval development time to the adult fly stage by about 25 percent, but the p value is better than 0 0.001. We have done things of broadcasting to affect depression and anxiety in people at a distance. We're now going to take on uh, parents, and parents who have children thought to be autistic to broadcast to both of them. Uh, there's, uh, that gives you an idea of how you can utilize this, so these sorts of things. Um, I have done that. And so this is the kind of plot you would have in terms of plotting the magnitude Q sub capital N as a function of processing time with the activated intention host device. And it starts out, the data starts out at QM0, that's our normal reality. Um, and to time T1, where you start to get a change, always moving in the direction of the imprint statement. And so you, you have this transition, this non-linear effect that develops. And if you, uh, if you take the intention host device away before you reach that upper plateau at QM1, then system just slowly decays. By slowly, I mean over a month, uh, at least. And, uh, and T1 is the order of a month. And uh, you go to T2, you leave it there till beyond T2, which is the order of two to three months. And then it flatlines at about close to the imprint uh, uh, statement magnitude. And it can stay there for a very long time. We had examples where it, it can be a year or more. But the thing that is important for you to understand that this kind of alchemy is not equilibrium thermodynamics. It is metastable thermodynamics. And what I mean by that, suppose you, the example you will understand best is, is the laser. Take a crystal which is set up with its engineering to be able to be a laser. You pump it with the appropriate um, incoherent light of the right intensity. That lifts the electron, electrons absorb those photons, and it lifts their electronic state to higher levels of reality. And when they get to the appropriate level, then they decay and they trigger the decay of their neighbor um, as they decay towards the ground state. But when they trigger the, the decay of neighbor after neighbor after neighbor, then what you have is a coherent beam of light 
which goes out the end of the a properly engineered crystal. Now, so long as you pump, continue to pump with that incoherent light, you will continue, the system will continue to laze. But if you stop pumping, the whole system will decay at the ground state, the equilibrium thermodynamic state. So in operation, it's a metastable thermodynamics. It's higher energy, higher free energy per unit volume. And, and that's, we have in nature often metastable thermodynamic states, which over time, sometimes, very, very long times, um, it decays to the equilibrium state. It often goes through a number of metastable states to lower and lower thermodynamic free energy. So, in our case, we're doing the same sort of thing. We imprint the device into a higher level of reality. And the device conditions the space and to a higher gauge symmetry state, and the space itself then causes the properties to change according to the intention that's in the device. And so long, what, what happens then is you've got this change, and if you just leave it alone, a year, two years, five years, sometimes as much as little as three months, then it will decay over another three months back to the ground state. And so you have to re-imprint. And generally we try to, so think of it as like a bell curve. It causes an effect in a bell curve. And then down again, we try to re-imprint in a particular space where we're doing the experiment. That's sort of like a peak of the bell curve. So we imprint it and it's just like pumping the system for the laser. So for example, to do the thing of broadcasting to these uh, children who are thought to be autistic, uh, we anticipate we will imprint and we'll broadcast to them at a distance. Um, and in three months, we'll re-imprint. And so things go for another three months or more. But we re-imprint at six months and we re-imprint at nine months. And so, for a year, in essence, you, you have this thing in, you, you maintain a metastable thermodynamic state. That's the point. You, you can do these things, but you've got, you want, you like them to be true alchemy where you've changed things forever. Well, it's not that. But the point is you could have it function forever, but for a very, very long time, so long as you re-imprint at the appropriate time. Now we have to learn, in the case, let's say, the case of these children thought to be autistic, that uh, when we're broadcasting to maybe a hundred or a thousand simultaneously, that puts a load on the broadcasting station. So we have to learn when do we have to re-imprint. We know that if we do it just for one, uh, which is kind of costly, um, we re-imprint it three months. So it maybe it's going to be two. Maybe if we get to the place where we can uh, broadcast to a million people, um, maybe we have to re-imprint every two weeks. I don't know. These are things we have to learn. But, but you need to get the idea of this. And I haven't talked about this before. Just neglect it. That is metastable from the hands, basically. Okay, so, that, so those were the four target experiments, and uh, goodness, the, there are five unique things that we see happening in the space, the conditioning of the space. The space is remarkably conditioned. The first thing that happens is you get a DC magnetic field effect. I'm going to have to skip along quickly, it seems. And that, it's like this. You're measuring pH as a function of time, and you put a, uh, a DC magnet, say a circular ceramic one, underneath the jar of water that, that uh, you're measuring. Then what you find when you condition the space that the south pole lifts the pH, makes it more alkaline. If the north pole facing the water, 
makes it more acidic. But if you do the experiment in an unconditioned space, you get nothing, nothing different at all. And that's what you'd expect because we only have magnetic dipoles in distance time reality. So, next one is that what we see is the material properties oscillate, whether we're talking about air temperature, water temperature, water electrical conductivity, um, or pH. They just, they oscillate. And for example, here are some oscillations of the air temperature at four different locations in a room, uh, a room sort of 10 by 10 by 10. And the, what we find is in, in the oscillations, these are pretty large temperature oscillations, the order of three degrees uh, centigrade. And, uh, but we find that they're in the very low frequency range, not what we normally work with, you know, kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, it's a tenth of a hertz to a millionth of a hertz. So very slow. Okay? Um, and we find that, you know, if you see oscillations in the air, the first thing the Orthodox scientists would say is that, oh, you've got a temperature inversion and you, you've got Bernard convection and that's why you get the oscillations. So we tested that very seriously. And we found that when we blow a fan on thyristors measuring these things in various parts of the room, that they jiggle a bit, but the oscillations are not, they do not disappear. So the oscillations are not in the air. They're in the vacuum between the fundamental particles that make up the atoms and molecules. So they're in those interstices. It's at a level, the next level of reality that's getting involved with the vacuum level of reality. And we find also that the room is, becomes very coherent. That is, if we make, let's say we're measuring temperature, temperature alone, and we take anywhere in the room, or even outside in the hall, and we look at the wave shape and we make a Fourier transform of it, and we plot them, and we plot them together, we find they all nest. That is, they're all replicating each other. Well, that says the coherence length in the room is at least uh, 12 feet or more. And so it's a long range. The coherence length of the room is just huge compared to the molecular size. Um, And so we see that not only do we access something that looks like magnetic monopole effects, but we access coherence. We access the vacuum and we access the coherence, the coherence level in the vacuum created. Uh, what we have found that if we have this uh, jar of water that we're measuring, pH, and we, it's in a small Faraday cage. The uh, shape of the amplitude profile is not just a simple decay outside of the cage, but it, it goes down and then it goes up to a maximum and then it goes down again. And if you take that cage and jar of water away, the oscillations are still there in space. So what we think of it as the cause of those oscillations has been removed. But the oscillations will decay very slowly, okay? When I say slowly, I mean a month. That's, again, none of these things do we see in our normal reality. So we're talking about things outside of our normal reality. In quantum mechanics, you hear about uh, entanglement. And if you look at the data, it's generally you can get quantum entanglement if you are working in close to absolute zero and if you're using very small moieties. We find we can get entanglement over 6,000 miles or over 100 yards um, or over 1,000 miles um, with room size, 10,000 cubic foot rooms at room temperature and over these huge distances. So, 
it's entangling, but it's certain it's probably connected to quantum mechanics. Um, but probably the quantum mechanics when it's uh, fully mature. So we see all of these, these effects, and we see long-range entanglement between properties. Um, people have wanted to do this, uh, some of this work, and the water pH is the easiest thing. Um, and so we say, okay, here, do background, and once you've done background, uh, we'll send you an imprinted device, and so you can do some experiments. Well, whether they're in England or in Milan, Italy, um, within England, within three weeks, they get our data. In Milan, it took only a week to get the same kind of effects that we did. Um, in this kind of intention stuff, you have to give it strong emotion. And we know Italians, they seem to be able to do that very well. <laughs> the thing we found, just as we found with the um, DC magnetic field effect, we take that as an indicator of that we've reached the SU2 gauge level. And we thought, well, is this possibly happening in humans? Is there such a thing? And so we did an experiment using kinesiology, you know, just testing the strength of a nerve muscle, um, and looked at the associated uh, acupuncture points on the chest that were associated with the particular muscle group. And if you bring the south pole of a bar magnet within about a centimeter of that, the muscle is really strong, you can move it. If you turn around and put the north pole about a centimeter away, pointing to this, and it weakens. So that says that there is in the body something at this higher gauge symmetry level. And because the proprioceptors and muscles are subtly connected to the acupuncture meridians, it said that the acupuncture meridian is already at the issue 2 level. So that using your own intention, you can enhance the capabilities of your acupuncture meridian system. So, in my terminology, the energy involved is magnetoelectric. Most people would call it qi. And so, that's where qi comes from. And you can enhance that, and if you enhance the flow through the meridians, of course, that induces stronger electric currents in the meat part of our bodies. So, interesting stuff. Um, let's see where I'm going. Okay, I'm, I'm beyond my time uh, for as far as Q&A. So, well, let's take 10 minutes of Q&A and ask any questions you like. Yes? If you are broadcasting the broadcast, okay, what would you expect to broadcast? Um, we will broadcast a particular intention that I've written for the kids to aid their ability to get um, their soul self into their physical body self. That seems to be a problem. There's a really, real impedance mismatch there that's a real challenge for them. So, that's what I'm presuming. But in essence, we will imprint a device, and we will put that device in one shed, and we'll put a different device in another shed for the parents, because the parents need to know that their children aren't broken, they're just challenged, and that, uh, therefore, they have to help them to make this thing work. So they have to do, they have to do things within themselves, and they have to come to realize that they're not broken, uh, and that they can be, there's a possibility of fixing them. Fixing is not a word they like, but to make it, make them uh, overcome their challenges. Does that answer your question? Right, so you're, you have a, a, a global intention, it's not specific. Global. No, in this case, it's, a, it's because, just as we did with the depression and anxiety experiment, broadcast over thousands of square miles, um, just using a name and address, uh, cycling in a computer. So it's just, um, 
So the intention is broadcast and the address, specific address is broadcast. And uh, we found significant changes over an eight month period with P values better than 0.001. So, yes, please. Um, I Well, the issue is the you cannot um, this kind of effect cannot happen in a normal reality. But the, if you if you lift it to the SU two gauge level, um, that appears to be what you have to have to access supersymmetry. Okay, and so. Because if you do the experiment in one condition space, you can never do this. And this is hard to, to get, this nice clear result. Um, it's unequivocal that you're seeing uh, a DC magnetic field effect. And that just cannot happen in our U1 gauge world. Because we have only diamonds. And so um, the answer may turn out to be somewhat different. But, but if you have an SU2, we'll come to it later, um, SUN, you deal with, you, you, you need n squared minus 1 moieties. So if it's SU2, you need 2 squared minus 1, which is 3. And 3, we'd have the electric monopole, the magnetic monopole, and the coupler, which I'll talk about, which is needed because some of this stuff is going faster than light, and the other is going slower than light. So, do you think that the, the, the magnetic monopoles would be like some, something like quarks that are. I don't I, I don't. I don't know. The quarks generally is this issue 3. Okay. Yeah. So, it's 3 squared minus 1 is, nine, is 8. Um, and uh, Murray Young Man got his Nobel Prize for the Eightfold Way, which was, deals with quarks and quantum, quantum chromodynamics. Yeah. So, um, it looks like, this is a working hypothesis. All along, I may say these things as if I really know, but it's a working hypothesis until I can prove it. Yeah. So, yeah. Right, come to the next. Yeah. Okay. yeah. My question relates to the broadcasting from one device and so forth to another, because you were talking about about a three-month cycle. And, so and it's not necessarily to a, to a broad, we, when we broadcast, mm -hmm. we don't broadcast to another, although we have broadcast to another device, we right. just give you the name and address. Yeah, I just, I, I wanted to go from that and just pose a couple of questions, because what I've noticed just in looking, seeing intuitively and so on, is that oftentimes if you use a device that has unique color spectrums, unique geometry, unique other features, and you reproduce it, one will resonate with another. And I'm wondering if you've ever tried making groups of devices based on, you know, say, similarities ranges in groups of those you're working with. That way, you can have a large device transmitting to the others over a regular time, thus not having to necessarily uh, every three months with somebody. Uh, so these are, these are things we still have to learn. Yeah. How to alter our device to mm -hmm. make it more powerful and, and uh, have a longer lifetime so that the, the scuffler doesn't decay uh, as rapidly. I definitely so like to get with you on that. We have to yeah. uh, work that out yet. Yeah. There we go. There, there's a small but growing literature on um, the influence of geocosmic rhythms on material properties, and I just wondered when I saw your yeah. oscillations whether, and especially literature on water, I might add. Uh, there yeah. was Picardi yeah. back in the 60s, his book yeah. on medical climatology. Well, I think so, it is a geocosmic thing. I think that yes. we're talking about, we're talking to the universe. Okay. Is, uh, so, because, because you see the, the velocity of the signal uh, can be in the order of C squared, mm. as I'll show. Uh, and so it wouldn't take much time, even for the furthest part of the universe, the cosmos, to be sending the signals that we're capturing with our instrumentation. So looking at the periodicity, have you looked at, uh, considered, I mean, what possible 
correlations of what's going on out there may be influencing the water. We're, we're, <laughs> Walter and I are working very hard on that kind of thing because it's, it's the issue of the entanglement that comes. See, the proposal is that there's a duplex space. Okay, so there's two, and they're reciprocals to each other, which we'll come to in, in the next session. Um, the, and then there's temperature and pH and can be magnetic fields. So you have, when, it, when you, if you double the kind of spaces, the subspaces you're dealing with, then you're doubling the kinds of equations you have to have. And when you're talking about two different kinds of properties, you're doubling that again. So you're talking about four things interacting. And when there, something happens to make a change in one, you see it in all the others, you see it in the, the wave shape, and you see it in the Fourier transform. Mm. So you, you really can see these things playing with each other, and we haven't figured out yet uh, how to give it a really quantitative, uh, a nice quantitative answer. But one last sub-question. But you seem to indicate it relates to the conditioned space. Whereas oh, Picardi and these other guys uh, were just finding it as a phenomenon, not necessarily oh, with yeah, attention. But, but in the unconditioned space, there are two, two things here. One is in the unconditioned space, you wouldn't have as many things in the ah. And you wouldn't have the characteristics that we tend to see. The reciprocal nature is crucial, and I'll show you some data. What it says is that there's a kind of inversion here of the properties between these two spaces. The other thing is that I think that in the cosmos, um, this couple has been growing very slowly for a long period of time. And that that's basically why, um, in a medical experiment, uh, 30 years ago you wouldn't see placebo effects. Now, I many of you might see 5% or 10%. Now you see 80% to 90%. So something is happening out there that because in the in the experiment with the doctor uh, a treatment patient and placebo it does the placebo it no longer acts like a placebo it's as if these are all should be thought of as vectors and you sum them to a system vector and but what you can measure is the intensity and you have to then take a system vector multiply it by its complex conjugate. And when you do that, you see that the, uh, the placebo has a term multiplying it from the doctor, from the treatment, from the patient. So it is no longer a placebo in the realistic sense. It is acting like part of yeah. the system. I'll come back to you if... if uh, I don't see other hands. Yeah, uh, I could not remember to ask about the experience with respect to conditioned versus non-conditioned spaces. Uh, I noticed, for example, Dr. Joey Kirsch Jones when he did his yep. when he did his experiment, you know, with cells in petri dishes before and after gamma, he noticed a big difference in terms of if the space was clean mm -hmm. of chaotic patterns, right? And I've noticed also that seems to have in terms of vibrational imprints from you know over time. Have you also noticed the effect in terms of? PK in terms of other phenomena that when there's more people who are of a positive mind or at least neutral, it's a lot easier whereas if most of the people oh, of are real skeptical, they're, they're, so there is a by, by their own biofield, they're conditioning yeah. the space in a beneficial way. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. a natural process. The more of this couple that occurs, the more connected all people will be and all things will be. So we're getting close to the place where you know, orthodox medicine will not be able to do a, uh, a standard kind of experiment that they have been doing. So basically, because everything will be connected. So basically, when positive people are together, we're creating a matrix that grows as there's more vibrational frequencies within that frequency domain. We're, we're pumping. Yeah. Is there one in the back? Okay. Yeah. Yes, the lady, oh, the lady was first and you'll be second. And then we'll close it. Oh, well, we haven't done it. I'm just 
working on just finished writing the imprint statement. But the issue can be answered by what we did with the question of the value. generates 
in the negative energy sea, a pair production, an electron, and a hole. And you go through the arguments and you see that the hole has to have positive mass and it has to have a positive energy. So, uh, and, and basically is like the electron. So it, that was the first aspect of antimatter. Now, Orthodox science absolutely hated the idea of a negative energy seat because they couldn't figure out what does this mean. Well, there were, there were important things uh, about that. That, that is, uh, so the, the, that, the low of the zero line, that's all the vacuum, the physical vacuum, because it, all of the positive stuff is is in, in the upper part. And anything that doesn't have the electrical is the physical vacuum because we're calling the upper part the physical. We might want to change that after a while. Anyway, the uh, I have difficulty. One way of looking at this is if you there's the up on the right hand side is the Quantum expression, uh, um, the I mean the relativistic expression for and e squared. And if you take e, then you can see when you square it on the right, you're going to plus or minus, and that's the minus that Dirac took as the negative energy C. But usually people don't like that, and so they just neglect the minus part. But if you look, if you say, okay, because of some queer thing, and I'll show you a queer thing in a bit. Um, you should think of it as a vector rather than as a scalar. And a vector is an amplitude, capital R sub K, K being sort of a wave number, um, times e to the i theta K. And theta is the phase angle. And so if you say, oh, the first part is positive, but the second part can be positive or negative, and therefore the whole thing is negative. In fact, if you look at the lower one, and we let theta be between zero and pi, then e to the i theta is a positive number, cosine and sine. But if you let theta be between pi and two pi, it's negative. And so it multiplies the positive, and so now it's negative. That's one possibility, one possible way to think about it. Um, and not be scared of it being a negative thing. I'll give you a couple of others. Um, let's see. Well, the other one is a figure. Suppose we consider, here's a case of a beryllium beryllium diamond interacting as you bring the atoms closer together. Then you get the dynamo curve, and you can solve quantum mechanically the energy states in there, and they're given from sort of 0 to uh, 10, where the two atoms dissociate. Well, it's been habit to put the origin at the root of this, uh, this dynamo in terms of the energy. And therefore, everything up above is positive. These are positive energy states. However, if you decide to pick the dissociation point, then everything below it is negative. So that's another way of, of thinking about it. So suppose in nature there is a field which underlies everything in our cosmos. You might call it a ground field, if you like. Then, relative to that potential, if you use the dissociation point, these things unfolding, then, in fact, it would all be negative energies. It's another way of thinking about this. Um, and another way, um, finally, stepped in, he said his prescription for negative energy particles, solutions, 
they're propagating backwards in time. And they get that, in fact, are equal to positive energy antiparticle solutions um, propagating forwards in time. So there was a way from the Feynman rules and Feynman uh, diagrams that you could see that aspect. Um, and if we go a step further, then what this, this means, if we look at a uh, our present system of the uh, Hmm. The standard model, okay, of where cosmos comes from. That, and, and you can have a non-standard model. A non-standard model is where you can deal with both energy greater than zero and energy less than zero. And what that does, it upsets causality, it produces um, anti-retro causality, which means that the source is in the future and it propagates into the past versus the thing we have now, that would be a symmetrical situation. The thing we have now is um, asymmetric, where the cause is always thought of in the past and the ultimate action is in the future. So this kind of thinking really opens our minds to considering possibilities we haven't really considered very well before. Now one thing that um, I want to bring up at this point, which is, which is important, because when we talk about the Broly stuff next, the, you need to remember something about the vacuum. The vacuum, electromagnetic energy, propagates through the vacuum. The macroscopic vacuum is transparent to electromagnetic waves. Okay? And the thing about electromagnetic waves going through the vacuum at the velocity of light, if you change the frequency of the waves, then the wavelength adjusts to give you C, the velocity of light. It doesn't change. Okay? What that means, is with the transparency as well, that It's not interacting with anything. See, so it means it's a non-dispersed medium, the vacuum. And a non-dispersed medium, I'll show uh, from some work by Eisberg and, and maybe others earlier, that uh, the stuff of the medium is going faster than the velocity of light. John Wheeler and others eventually calculated that in order for uh, quantum mechanics and relativity theory to be internally self-consistent, then the vacuum had to have a latent energy storage of 10 to the power 94 grams per cc. It's a huge number. But I ask you, if all of that kind of stuff is in the vacuum, and the vacuum is transparent, and if the vacuum doesn't interact with electromagnetic light, so that it's a non-dispersive medium, how can it be all of those things be together? Well, if they go faster than light, it's not a problem, because if all of the stuff that's in there, all the subtle energies that are in there, are going faster than the velocity of light, then if it's not coupled, it's not, it's not a coupled system, then the electromagnetic energy can't interact with it, and therefore, because if it did, it would be a dispersive medium. So there's so much data that you can look at that makes sense out of this sort of thing. Anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to uh, discourage. Okay, let's now look at gravity and what, what I just talked about. Gravity, we know, the force is proportional to the product of two positive masses divided by the separation of distance. Okay? So, if we look at the various cases you can have, um, if we look at the circumstance of m1 being greater than zero in the electric domain, m2 greater than zero 
and the velocity less than the velocity of light, and you get normal, normal gravitation, okay, curvature of space, um, with respect to both mass and with photons that produce curvature of space. So we see our normal um, energy effects. Now let's go to the other, the next circumstance, where we're talking about from the, the material of the negative energy state. That's negative, if it's negative energy, it's negative mass. And so now you take two negative mass particles from the, the uh, sea of negative energies, and you get a positive. So again, you get a gravitational effect, but they're going faster than the light, so you can't see them. So all you have is an, an attractor. You see the effect of the curvature, Occurring, but you can't see what's doing it. Makes perfect sense. So dark matter and dark energy are from a physical vacuum, and from the, at least from the coarsest level of the physical vacuum, which I call magnetic information stuff. So that answers that question in a very simple way. Now let's go to the acceleration of planets and stars at the outer edge of the universe. Um, so we know that there's huge amounts of antimatter, and we know that it congregates most in the central part of the cosmos. But the stuff that's accelerating that we can see, that's positive matter. And so the negative mass of the dark matter in the central part of the universe, those two are interacting. One is positive, one's negative, so force is negative. It's a repulsive force. The repulsive force causes those planets and stars to be accelerated, not decelerated. Okay? Simple. Um, and what this kind of gives rise to, when you think about it, is ultimately, if you're looking in the subtle energy domain, the possibility exists. I mean, these things uh, generate levity. Okay? You can have levitation within humans, certainly. Uh, uh, is documented in terms of Buddha masters. They can float down halls and around corners and, right. and such. Uh, this is a, ultimately a human capability. And what it would mean is that it's necessary to learn how to draw magnetic information wave material that the course is level of the physical vacuum into yourself. And as you do that, you will get lighter and lighter because you're in, that stuff is interacting with yourself, but it's also interacting with the earth that holds us. And eventually you get to the place where you're repelling from the earth and you lift off. Yes. So, and ultimately if we can do it within ourselves as we develop ourselves, then it can become a technology, future technology. So that's interesting. So let's go to the last question. I have expanded the picture of Dirac to suggest what nature looks like. So there's the electric monopole substance stuff. Uh, it's positive, so the antimatter is, is actually uh, in that positive energy state. These things are all, see, all interacting with each other. And the magnetic monopole substance levels, and then the emotion domain level, and then the mind domain level, and then the spirit domain level. The last three, emotion, mind, and spirit, I think is mainly our soul self. And I would prefer, rather than thinking that just electric monopole is part of our biobotic suit cell, I think that plus the magnetic monopole substance stuff. So I call the electric stuff the coarse physical reality and the magnetic monopole stuff the fine physical reality. In terms of size of atoms, in the electric monopole stuff, um, which goes slower than light, they may be the order of an angstrom, okay, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. A magnetic monopole might be down another 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So they can go in and out, they can go through uh, solid materials, etc. Um, in my model, my working hypothesis. So, now let's go back 
to Dirac's view that the way you got the first electron was to have cosmic ray come in from outside, but there's no stuff there in the beginning. However, if these other three levels, they're transparent to our eyesight and our instruments, um, they would be all pre-physical, um, and therefore the ejection of a particle upwards from one of these levels into the hole that became the antimatter, then it changes the character of that hole, so it's no longer considered as a point defect of the antimatter type, because it is uniquely different. Now. So that would mean that the population of the antimatter decreases, and therefore the ratio of matter to antimatter is always greater than one, which tends to buttress the idea that this is sort of what nature looks like. I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's, it allows one to think of that. And the coupler substance in the whole picture that I think of is, I think of it from the emotion domain level, that's my working hypothesis. So, and here is the picture. This is the cosmic ray at sub C, H near sub C. It gives an E minus and an E plus, and from the, the probability from the motion domain to upward send, you have the E plus plus, you've captured the moiety of some sort from the motion domain, and therefore it changes, it changes the uh, population of E minus up top, and that's why you have the ratio almost greater than one. Okay, let's talk next about the uh, de Broglie particle tidal wave. Um, in general, orthodox science only looks at the upper picture with the wave group and the particle. And you can simply calculate that they're moving at the same velocity. I don't think that captures the pilot uh, wave at all. That's really down below, um, and it's moving through the wave group and out into the next wave group, um, but it's going faster than light, I'll show. Um, and you, therefore you can't see it. You don't have any instruments. In essence, you can calculate that the product of the, of the velocity of a particle times the velocity of the pilot wave is equal to c squared. And since Vp the particle is always less, or relativity theory is always less than C, and VW is greater than C. So it goes fast. So, the Professor Eisberg uh, wrote a book on, on modern physics in 1961, and he combined the two de Broglie theoretical postulates that the wavelength, lambda on the left, is equal to Planck's constant over the momentum, and the frequency is equal to energy over uh, Planck's constant. And when you, if you don't, if you use non-relativistic mechanics, all you get, you, just, you just get that the wave group velocity, V sub G, is equal to the particle velocity. But if you put in, use the relativistic energy analysis, you get both. You get both the group velocity is the same as the particle velocity, but the, you get the other one also Vp times the pilot wave velocity is c squared. And so if I go back, if you're interested, you're also interesting enough, out of the same analysis you get a form of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle on the right, which sort of buttresses the idea. People an Orthodox guy rejected a paper of mine uh, because he says, well, that's because he used a dispersed system as if, and I showed you earlier, that vacuum, electromagnetic energy going through a vacuum, that's a non-dispersed system, and therefore the velocity is greater than the velocity of light there. But, so, it was just humorous in his part, I'm afraid. <laughs> it happens. So, anyway, and the important thing 
for us to understand, and there really should be some good work done on to buttress this. And that is, if, you, if you're going to heal someone, you can heal someone by telephone over thousands and thousands of miles. Um, and, you, and you find there's so much growing information that the human higher qualities um, are not distance and time dependent. That's really important. So people should start to seriously gather that information. Because counting on today's orthodox quantum mechanics and orthodox relativity theory um, is not going to help us as much as we thought it would. So let's uh, have questions now. Lady in back. Oh, I think it's, uh, I, I think the, well, I don't think they know what they're doing, uh, in essence. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff, but serious stuff, I don't, I think it's going to come out of these things we're talking about today, um, where the mechanism would be the broadcasting um, of a healing energy which is outside of distance time. So, to, they think they have a mechanism, but not really a, a detailed mechanism. Um, Choose to sweep and rub, ignore it. 
That's the dilemma. It's a, because it's a huge change required of them. Um, the head of engineering of NSF um, gave me a talk in Japan and said that when you're dealing, well, remote viewing was important to the government because they wanted to see things far away, but, um, and Walter, I've forgotten his name. Uh, Werbos. Werbos, thank you. Uh, Werbos said, and he was um, Schwinger's, one of Schwinger's PhD students, uh, who was Nobel Prize in uh, quantum mechanics, so he's no sludge. He said that no matter what quantum mechanics you use, no matter all those that um, people deal with, none of them can explain something like remote viewing. And the governments of the world have spent billions and billions of dollars trying to do it and have failed. Well, it's because they're not they're not expanding the science. His view is you just have to get out of the box. So. Yeah, um, I wanted to kind of ask and tie four things together because I think you, you, what you showed explains it. Uh, this is going to be a little scary for me because this is not something that, it, it's not easy to talk about these kinds of things. But anyhow, uh, I was talking to, with you earlier about some of the Doppler shifting technology and when I combine complementary pixels, yep. things would go forwards and backwards. And of course, and I've been working... Right, right. And of course, I've been working with Future Self uh, mm -hmm. since the 80s and other stuff um, you know, like that. And I noticed that, like, for example, in terms of levitation, uh, when you use, like, say, Steve Richards' model, you know, where first you're meditating, being you know, like hot, and then you're imagining the space between them, the molecules and you're f focusing on space above your head. And the hardest part is it doesn't, it feels like it's your imagination. And I notice in terms of by location, uh, you know, when I would imagine being somewhere, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just imagining, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, feeling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people kept on saying, no, you're here. And I'm like, no, that, you know, I, I understand quantum mechanics says we can, but I have this part of me that pretends that that's not easy to understand the, uh, the, the math stuff on the thing there. And I also noticed in terms of when you're doing that with sound waves in both directions, it, it se there seems to be another state that's not necessarily past, present, future. It's, it's just, it doesn't seem like that's the real model. Because I know that when I was asked to do remote viewing on what was in Master Chalkuxway's office a couple years ago, and I did a 45-minute tape, and of course I was, you know, in trance. I was... I just, I, my body was talking, but they said I got every picture, got every, uh, you know, the, 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 the size, the dimensions, the colors, whatever. And I noticed at first when I saw a slide, uh, 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 half, half a year later of what I saw, I mean, I just, I broke out in tears. It was terrifying. I knew, I, I know I'm accurate, but it's, a, it's another thing when you actually see it, you go, oh my God. Uh, Mary was there when I saw the slide, and I was like, you know, so I'm, I, it, it seems like when you're doing this equation, this is the first time I felt safe, because it's hard to have these conversations, and it's difficult in terms of prove it. But I also noticed that after these space-time things go on, it seems to be easy enough to perceive what someone's going to say and so forth, as long as there's the neutrality. And that seems to be the big thing, is being detached, not caring, not being tied to the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, easier said than done, uh, at least for me, anyways. But well, we'll race, race, race. Uh, in the past, up until now, not as easy as it should be. Uh, I'll go with that one. Well, that, that's why I yeah. write these free white papers and put them on the website. Yeah, so we people can access them and they can see that there's information that they're going to use. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the cause I know they, it they, seems they, to be tied also with a person's perception to register. Because I notice that, for example, if I use, uh, for the sake of a model, the Alice Bailey model, if I myself, or if I take a group, you know, physical, on up through divine, logoic, cosmic, whatever, the people not in, they think that they see us disappear into a ball of light and then come back. From the perception of those of us in, it's definitely a different feeling, but we do feel here. And I notice also in terms of invisibility experiments, and again, I started with the Steve Richards model, uh, which is more, I guess, of a cloaking and intention. 
and so forth, I noticed that it was pretty easy for people not to be able to see, scan, or whatever, but again, from my perception, mostly I was holding the intent of being invisible, the intent of a mirror, and the intent of, I guess you, I don't know if it's dark matter or if it'd be the opposite, but what got, what made it easier was some of the, the, the imaging that I came up with where when you look at it, it appears to flash, because again, I'm working with complementary colors and Doppler shifting. So I'm, I'm thinking you can tie this all together because it looks like that ties it. But like oh, I said, I got a, a very good home for this kind of evolving thing. Of course, it's yeah. CIHS and the community of people who come to listen to this. There's a heck of a lot of work to be done. Yeah, because so, uh, I've seen passing through good. solid objects. I know it can be done. And I did it once, but it was with a group of people. It was a blade of grass, and it was at a moment when I didn't care. Yep. And I've noticed that it's just, it just seems like when you're around a group of people that, have, that many of them have done it, these things get very easy. Well, and then when you're trying to show a bunch of skeptical people, it's just not as easy. But it seems to be therapeutic. I, don't well, know if I think it is, and so you're with a community of people that are open enough that they would be willing to experiment with some of these things. I and mean, I think and once the scientific community gets out of the box and really yeah. gives, it, gives gives this kind of thing real meaning, then um, very rapid progress will occur. But I see it as our, our the human future. Yeah. Have so, you noticed the therapeutic effects in terms of expansion of consciousness when people are doing these kinds of things? Like I haven't, we haven't gone that far in the scientific way. Because it seems to bring it up, but then the result. But, uh, you know, was there a question back there or not? The gentleman? Um, well, I think maybe we've gone back to 10 minutes. So we certainly have this. It's my fault. Now that you're standing, be clear. Okay, yeah. Should I ask a question? Sure. Ask the question. question. And then okay, okay. Uh, all right, my question is, uh, uh, so you're talking about uh, negative mass particles and uh, particles that travel faster than light. Um, my, my question is basically, um, would we expect to see any conventional physics effects from, from these? Uh, and well, there, if, if there's coupling, you will see... Only, only if there's coupling? Only if there's coupling, because if you're not interacting, you can't see any effects. Okay. Yeah. Um, my second, it's related to this, is uh, this, uh, uh, 10 to the 94. 10 to the 94, yeah. Um, but hasn't that observation uh, been disproved by astronomical observation. That is, uh, they found that the vacuum energy, they know that based on the equations of quantum mechanics, that it should have this huge energy for the vacuum. But then uh, the astronomical. If you, if you don't have instruments that can access it because it's all going faster than light, you won't know anything about it. Okay. All right, but I think that that's, that's the key issue here. And it, it turns out, in terms of numbers, if you calculate using the average um, electromagnetic energy density in the cosmos from astronomers, and you multiply it by the volume of the cosmos, a sphere of radius 15 million light years, you take that energy and you take a single hydrogen atom, okay, the order of 10 to the minus 23 cubic centimeters, and multiply it by 10 to the 94 grams equivalent per cc, and there's about a trillion times more potential energy in a single hydrogen atom of the physical vacuum than in all the planets and all the stars and all the cosmic dust in our cosmos, up to 15 billion light years. I mean, that's what our future is. Yes. Now, here we go. I think I've got to go forward. I'm only halfway through, so you're going to have to uh, look at the free white paper to get it. Much of the rest, so let me, let me just go forward. Um, so we have this dilemma of a faster than light pilot wave interacting with a slower than light uh, group wave and leading the particle somewhere. So that's just love in orthodox reality. So I decided how to 
my resolution was I invented the existence of a particle or a way of voyage that was unsigned uh, distance time, so it didn't have relativistic constraint requirements. And I called it a deltron. And I gave it the properties that it could go faster than light or slower than light. So that it could, on the one hand, interact with the faster than light subtle energies, and it could, on the other hand, interact with the positive energy and slower than light electric stuff. Um, so the, the issue, the first one here is we needed to expand, create a new reference frame which looked at physical reality as a duplex space, okay, consisting of two four-dimensional subspaces, one of which reciprocal subspaces, one of which has distance time. So all of our orthodox science behaves properly with distance time domain. And we have room in this other subspace. Because it's a reciprocal, one over distance is number per unit distance, which is the frequency. One over time is number per unit time, which is the temporal frequency. So it's a, it's a four-dimensional frequency domain. And the thing that we find in mathematics when you're dealing with reciprocal spaces, that property in one of the subspaces has a complex reciprocal property in the other subspace. And the connection between these two is there's a quantitative connection, which is a Fourier transform. And when you need a couple, because one's going faster than light and one's going slower, it becomes a deltron modular Fourier transform. Just, to, just to, mathematics is more complex, quite a bit more complex. Um, second thing, of course, is that the this physical reference frame, this duplex reference frame, is embedded in overall reality reference frame consisting of the higher dimensions of emotion, mind, and spirit. And that this is my postulate that there exists in the domain of emotion a moiety called deltrons, which can go faster than or slower than light, and thus interact with the other stuff. Right. So here is the way in which I visualize this interaction. <coughs> On the left is an electric particle surrounded by a cloud of deltrons, and on the right is a magnetic particle going faster than light, uh, surrounded by a cloud of deltrons. And the deltron-deltron interaction is what can cause them to interact. So we can begin to see with this kind of a picture that you could have interaction, secondary, secondarily interactions between uh, slower than light and faster than light systems. So, and uh, so basically, this is just sort of a structural view. Uh, <clears throat> the physical space is an upright human, and the conjugate is uh, rotated 90 degrees uh, human, where the acupuncture meridian system is in that human. That's where homeopathy also works. That's where the human unconscious works. Human unconscious does almost all the work for us. We're not very conscious at this point in our development. And then the higher dimensional stuff is the uh, is what our made constructs our spirits. So. And so all of this again is just this other picture that gives us a larger image of reality. So this is I tend to think that there is an absolute universe and a relative universe, and the relative universe um, is within the void. It's, we think we go to the void when we imprint uh, an intention host of us. So I'm just skipping along because, well, the, the key point that I want to be sure to bring up 
is that because in a duplex space and with reciprocal subspaces, Fourier transform becomes very important. And just as we teach young children, we give them blocks of various shapes and sizes and roundness, and etc. And as they play with these, their brain, the physical brain, grows. So, since we're moving ultimately out of distance time towards the epoch that would be this, what I call, our, our space, the magnetic information wave, and they're connected by a Fourier transform, in essence, we ultimately need the analog of, of blocks to teach children to have a familiarity with what the Fourier transform is. So here it is, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff. The, on the left hand side are a number of images of, of shapes uh, with a period of one centimeter. And the, the conjugate in reciprocal space, which is the Fourier transform, is We'll call them a, a bunch of fibers showing a pattern. And as you reduce or the number, which means you increase the spacing, and you go to two centimeter spacing, then four, and eventually infinity, then you see that each stage you get more of these fibers, and you fill in eventually that envelope, and ultimately, when you just have one, the Fourier transform has this on a lower shape. So that's, that's just what a Fourier transform means. It's a mathematical connection. Um, I'll try not to burden you with that. Um, what am I doing? Uh, just catch the screen. Just hit anywhere. Okay. Test it. And I try to move it. I can't go forward, I can't go back. Try escape. Try what? Escape. ESC. ESC? I don't use computers, do that's the option. I need help. Thank you. It's yours. I can still relate with you, Dr. Bill. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm going to pass the <laughs> the, These things were created without that memory. So let's take six <laughs> objects. <laughs> six <laughs> objects. A single slit or a single rod, and two of them in parallel, and a square, and a circle, and a triangle, and a star of David. So the reciprocal space image counterpart can be calculated. In the central is a plan view, and, it's, and in the right is a slice through that. So you see the oscillations, you get a very big central region and decaying sidebars. Interestingly enough, when you put the second one in parallel, you get wave diffraction. So it says that the that object, its R space counterpart, is a wave nature that gives you diffraction. And so you see the same thing as the first one on top, but now you see it's it's bifurcated split into oscillations in the opposite direction. And a slice through it gives a similar but different in size aspect. And every time you have parallel surfaces, you get that diffraction interference that occurs in square, and you see this cut through, it's different. The circle, none of that. The triangle is interesting in the sense that the reciprocal space counterpart is perpendicular to the face, and it doesn't go to zero. And again, with the Star of David, then you have this bifurcation, this um, interference pattern. And so it's interesting to look at the first one versus the second one and think of the young adult slit experiment. The proclivity towards having the diffraction pattern developed is already there in the method that makes the slip 
two slits. That's what I propose. So there's another way to explain the young double slit. Anyway, I'm moving on. Yeah. Fantastic. Good Here is an aspect that's important relative to this duplex space, which are reciprocals to each other. Then here and down below, of course, using the velocity. It's written sort of like a frequency. It should be should be a real double here. But again, it's the c squared over particle velocity. And so what that means, you see, Einstein said the problem is when you didn't have another space to think about it. You start accelerating the particle and it can never go to the velocity of light because it takes infinite energy. With the duplex space, you don't have to. You start going up that curve and you tunnel through to the pilot wave branch and conversely, coming down uh, from the pilot wave branch, you can tunnel through in the particle branch. So the possibility seems to exist that we can move from slower than light to faster than light aspects. And so the duplex reciprocal space has to be looked at in this fashion. So that there should be a z in that top and an arrow. So it's our normal distance time, x, y, z, and the reciprocal counterpart is going in the other direction. So what that suggests is that if we want to look at the reciprocal space pattern of planets, far away from the Earth, okay? In the XYZ space, they're way, way beyond us. But in the counter spot, reciprocal space, they're all down near the origin. You see, the, the issue is, in that kind of duplex coordinate system, there is information, huge amounts of information, <coughs> from the R space counterpart. Uh, and those who are interested in astrology rather than astronomy, to use just as a simple space-time reference frame is not adequate because you can't have interaction between the planets and the humans They're too far away. But in the reciprocal space, they're all down near that origin, and that's where our reciprocal space part is as well. So now we can interact with that aspect of the planets. So it should be interesting to do astrology using this kind of perspective. Well, this is sort of the way I see it. This is an Minkowski space time. <coughs> and this is a time axis going vertically and distance type axis going uh, perpendicularly. So our physical reality that we take is the electric atom molecule stuff, that's with P, and then come down to the next one. In those days when I was writing that, that's sort of E for etheric, which I now call magnetic information. And then A is the astral, uh, which is the motion, and so on. So that all of this is in the same space we're in. It's just a different band yeah. of that space. So, in the latter of understanding, I came to see it in a Minkowski sense. Each of these rungs is part of our future, or the, or the past, the lower soil. And uh, to find out the phenomena, multiple phenomena, and physics involved in the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, as we are on our journey home to total coherence with the all. So I think what I want to do is a bit more of this, and then we'll um, I'll try not to be over time more than not, not very much, and we can have Q and A. So how to make these Duplex patterns is interesting. If you take a laser and a beam expander and two lenses and a metal sheet in between with holes drilled in, and then a focusing system, you get a pattern on the screen. So that in the, the metal, that's like a D space pattern, and what's on the screen is the R space pattern. 
So here's an example of it. Let's say the mask is in the upper. So here we have two poles which are interacting with each other from the R space aspect and below is this diffraction pattern aspect. And you see in a perpendicular direction oscillations. And if you separate these poles, then what you find is the oscillations now. When you increase the size of the hole, the oscillation region gets small. If you make it rectangular vertically, then you see a shift uh, in a horizontal in the reciprocal space. If you rotate the pair, then the reciprocal space part rotates in the opposite direction. And as you add holes, you make more complex patterns in reciprocal space. And the, we'll come back to this one on the right, the hexagonal pattern. And if you use a circular array and a spiral array, what you find is mandalas in the other. And we know there are lots of people who meditate yes. and perceive mandalas in their heads. Yes. So there is some information that says this, these postulates, uh, at least geometrically, are not nonsense. There's something there that we need to learn more about. Uh, these are responses. So again, it's a richer array of mandalas. Oh, here's the one that we took the hexagon with the particular <laughs> spacing, and on the right is the experimental uh, reciprocal space pattern, and the left is the calculation, mathematical calculation using Fourier transform. So we see that the reciprocal aspect, the Fourier transform, is really the key aspect. And when you modify it um, with the deltron coupler, so you, because that's what you have to do if you're going to switch not just a Fourier transform, but a Fourier transform in which one part is slower than one and the other part is faster than one. Well, this is interesting what uh, Pribram found. When Pribram, he, he was looking at, he was monitoring what occurred in the cortical columns of the brain. Um, and so you, you have a, a pattern of information coming into the arm and going to the back of the arm. And then, basically, the cortical columns are, they act very much uh, the, the cortical neurons act like a single antenna in a very large antenna array. And so these are the pattern. On the right hand side is the pattern, which is very much like a Fourier transform in the brain. And it says, perhaps, the brain likes to do that because it's more efficient in terms of computing. So the unconscious can compute with that. But it also suggests that in order for us to see things the way we think we see with our conscious mind, there has to be an inversion mirror operating in the system, which I find interesting. Um, I think, well, I can talk a bit about gauge symmetry states, or we, if I'm going to keep on time, I think I better open for questions and you'll have to read the other stuff in the free library. Okay, first question. Yeah, uh, and... I might have some questions. So, anybody else have any questions? And then, because you've already asked questions. Sure. Now, I'm outside. Okay. You're all out. I'm going to ask you a question. If you can answer it, please. A little less up here, you know? Okay. Uh, in my experience, uh, emotion is the reaction between the mind and the body. You have a thought, you have a thought, and it has no reaction in the body, you have no emotion. And I see that you hold emotion as a 
separate substance, and I'm just curious as to why. Uh, let me tuition, working hypothesis. And the, the, to integrate effectively, you have to use emotion, you have to give it power. Um, mind is great, um, it's sort of the machinery, um, complex, wonderful, but the emotion, like you can say, oh, right, that, that, you build a rocket, the rocket's in your, in your, with your mind, but if you want it to not the ground, you can give it power, and that's where emotion comes in. Right, I'm not saying that emotion yeah. isn't something. Yeah. So I, 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 discriminate, yeah, I discriminate, you see, just so that it, it is easier to, at least I think it's easier to uh, help understand piece by piece. Yeah. Yeah. Rather, than, rather just, than keeping it. I just don't see it as a separate substance without the interaction. Well, we're all one. Everything is, everything is spirit, in a sense. I happen to think we're all spirits having a physical experience as we ride the river of love together. Right. But um, all the pieces, the pieces that we learn in school in terms of stuff, um, intellectual stuff, and then we learn more about emotion and we have relationships, okay, which are different than the mind aspect. So, and we go through code of business, we deal with things, sometimes emotion gets in the way, sometimes when it's harnessed properly, uh, it is good, um, more mind being used. Um, so, I prefer to have them discriminated, because if they're discriminated, and you, and you find, and we find information that they are joined, and that's fine because they're un united. But to assume that they're a union in the very beginning, I think, is not getting the whole picture. So that's why I do it. So I offer it. Uh, a lady in a pink. Okay. Mine's not so much a question, but this is how I'm sorry, say, say it again. I said, mine is not so much a question. of that coupler, so you have energy coming in and up, modulation, demodulation, all that kind of translation of the energy, and that the photographs are actually visual proof of this energy. They are, they are indeed a manifestation in distance time. But I saw, I think, some of your pictures yesterday, which I thought were lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you can use that. When I looked at the analysis, or made an analysis of orbs, uh, from a theoretical perspective, compared to the experimental pictures that people were showing, I certainly felt that the, the pictures uh, taken with, by a really good photographer showed interaction uh, between things and uh, interacting with, with humans, etc. So uh, I think it is a great tool. Um, it has limitations, but it's a great tool, and it's revealing things that we need to know. But wouldn't that be a coupler, though? In our you can call it a coupler if you like. I use the coupler most <coughs> to talk about, in, in my work, or our work, things that go slower than light and things that go faster than light. So it, it could be in a family of couplers, let's put it that way. It's a tool. It's a very wonderful tool. I'd say it's more than a tool, but then, and what I've always been I think the great tool. Oh, yeah. The thing that's yeah. limiting our science is that it's, it's tools are, are very limited. But as far as measurement goes, what if it comes to, because you've got frequency and wavelength, and color temperature, Kelvin temperature, and stuff, what if it comes that 
with these photographs that you could actually in some way measure the strength of that energy is based on the, yeah. how I mean, Basically, all the information is valid. Right. Um, we have our own limitations as to how we qualify. Okay. That, that's yet to come, but I, I honor what you've done. And I, okay. I, and, and I think, too, as the, the cameras and the lenses, as, as they technology uh, develops, too, because I think right now the cameras are limited in what they can actually translate this energy because it's such as a high yeah. vibration, too, that the camera, the equipment's doing the best it can. Um, you can, I mean, I did work with back in the 70s mm -hmm. with a man who was biofield and such that he could condition the camera. Right. And you could see through the bodies of people, you could do all kinds of things. But that was a human device interaction. The human device interaction is crucial. Neither by itself gives you the whole picture. Right. So, um, that's something to think about. Yes, sons. Can you tell us a little about those Buddhist relics you mentioned and where they exist and which Buddhists actually created them? Well, Nisha is here. She can tell you some more about them. Um, there we go.
See, this is the, the issue we got after we you know, went into a deep state and, and requested uh, that, we, that our device uh, be able to access um, the loving kindness essence uh, encapsulated in this Buddha relic, the, the ring cell. And once that occurred, sort of at this region in the middle, uh, which after, after several months, and then it just took off and it went up two and a half pH units uh, in the next two months, and two and a half pH units is about uh, 60 million electron volts. So in essence, that's what the slope is showing. That, well, I did write down something, and I'll just read, because I was going to say this, because it tells there's an important issue in the, in the um, okay, the, the conclusions were the following. First, imprinted meaningful information into a simple, unimprinted, intention host device by a passive exposure to the Buddha relics is possible. Two, activating this intention host device information to in turn imprint itself into the space of a particular room so that a quantitative thermodynamic measure of the energetic essence can be physically realized is also possible. Three, crucially, a verbal request from a deep meditative state by four humans appeared to be a necessary condition for this embedded loving kindness essence to manifest itself in this way. And there it is. So, uh, do we have time for more questions or do you want to close it down? Uh, well, we have to pick up that lunch, so um, I don't know if you want to. It's up to you. Pick up the no, it's up to you. I'm wondering about the pH change, I must confess, because you know the meter shows millivolts in effect. No, no, I have no doubt that you're measuring some change. But, but my question is um, whether there's something intrinsic to the meter that may be changing rather than the water. And, oh, sure. Or, and with respect to that, have you ever looked at another measure of pH, for example, colorimetric? Uh, to the, show that it's really the, pH. The colorimetric is a problem. It seems to respond only to the digital system. Oh. So the pH electrode is important, but far uh -huh. beyond the color. So the digital system contains so much more information, gathers so much more information. Uh -huh. Actually, I think it's going to be 22. Okay. I address some aspect of that. The, uh, and, and what, what the error bar is mm. with respect to the complementary approach. So anyway, here is the issue of why the pH electrode works. We take the, this is the new one state, a normal reality. The relationship between voltage and pH is linear, and the V1 is the V, is, is the uh, what we're dealing with in the U1 state, and pH U1 is the intercept on that curve. Um, if you are dealing with a space that's del G sub H plus star higher, okay, and which is, gives you the other, and just assuming that it also is parallel, then if you carry through, what you see is that this is the pH that your system shows. That shows you the departure from the equilibrium. It's the difference between, between these two. So it's an ideal uh, device to, to show you a thermodynamic measurement and you, uh, solve the equations of just the solution of Boltzmann and Planck equations, where you, you put in a thermodynamic measure. I was going to show you, but we ran out of time. But basically, that's why it's, it's such an ideal thing in a 
mechanics like yourself, uh, someone who's willing to work with what chemistry is capable of doing so, then it works. But for the general public, it's not a good detector. Yes? Can I invite you to, to, to say a few more words about gate symmetry? You, you left off there. It's here already. Uh, just, you know, just a couple more words. Okay. Okay, here is... Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> basically, the gate symmetry state was developed by particle physicists in the last 50, 60 years. And so you take space-time and you treat it just like a two-dimensional sheet. Right? It's approximation. And um, you have a force and, in, in, and also the invention of an internal space is there that is, is being used. Mathematicians developed this called fiber mathematics. And uh, so what you have is these points on the space-time are position points. And then you have a, a, a field, electric field, magnetic field, acting on them, and that changes the phase of the electron in the system. And so that's, that's that dash line that's at the end of these fibers, these are called fibers. And so it turns out that at every point you have something like a a circle in which the phase angle can change in two dimensions. And that's what gives rise to the U1 gauge. Just, just one thing that's varied, can vary. Now, if we go to the issue 2, now you have two things. You have two phase angles you have to worry about. One is the electron, and the other is the magnetic one. So that you have to have a sphere at every point on this in the space-time issue as it's interacted by a field of some sort. So the upper line is the other one that is self-coherent. So it may indicate something about our work. We see the vacuum with huge levels of coherence in the room. If you break the symmetry, Okay, so that you just have a free that that takes this back to the U1 state. We'll talk more about it in this white paper 26, which should be on the website by this afternoon. <coughs> um, um, let me make one take one more minute. <coughs> the thing that's important, or one of the things that occurred to me when I was writing this. The, you'd like to not deal with this stuff, but, and yet on the other hand, you're interested in the acupuncture meridian system. You're interested in human chakras. Okay. You're interested in electrical measurements of skin and so on. So, at the SU2 level, you have this fiber map development. But it's basically group theory that you're dealing with, which means that's territory that's important to you. But if you look at SUN, n squared minus 1 interactions involved. SU2, the classical one, is the interaction, there's got to be three players. And that's the interaction between the neutron and the proton and the neutrino. Okay, that's. Orthodox science loves that. If it's SU3, then 3 squared is 9, minus 1 is 8. Okay. And Murray Gell-Mann got his Nobel Prize for the Eightfold Way, which is quantum chromodynamics using quarks. So you, but SU2 is the stuff that we're dealing with, and it's electric, Magnetic, one poles, and a couple. So three. Now, so that's part of why the SU2, but it, in terms of the Buddha rocks, we have some information that suggests that it could be as much as 20. 
20 squared is 400 minus 1 is 399 interacting entities in the in that operation system. So it's really advanced. And you can imagine having intelligence and doing things without any nerves, without any brain, etc. It's dealing with a level of reality that we will all deal with somewhere down the road. Um, but I'm making a plea that you start to be willing not to be afraid of some of these things. Because the non Abelian algebra and quaternions are beyond vectors, but, but if you Abelian algebra is two times two is four. Function A times function B minus function B times function A. That's Abelian algebra. It's equal to zero. But non-Abelian algebra, A B minus B A is not zero. So it's a higher level of consideration, and it comes in if you, if you're looking at a three space or normal reality, it's just space, and you want to make look at the electromagnetic power density. That's the electric field is a three vector in space, and the magnetic field is a three vector in space. So three times three gives you a tensor with nine units. Okay, the nine units are at every point. And that's a belly algebra. But go to a space-time application where you're, where you're now taking a four space, a four vector. Four vector by the four vector is not a belly. Or a three times three times three is not a belly. So you see that things really change in a very meaningful, quantitative way. And, and to see why it's that way, you have to go to quaternions. So the point is, as we evolve in our space, as we penetrate into space deeply, into our local internal space, the same room, either by going there through meditative states or trying to go there with mathematics, or you want to deal with meridian systems and chakras, this is the stuff you're going to have to deal with if you want to be really serious about it. So that's why I just bring it up. Anyway, that's, that's done. Okay. I'm trying to work on that.